countries are faced not only with significant development challenges, but are also dealing with some of the worst impacts of climate change, which magnify those challenges. And climate action is a precondition for effective sustainable development, and the LDCs are very much at the forefront of these efforts. So we welcome to the stage um, his Excellency Lotte Schering, Prime Minister of Bhutan, Her Excellency Saliwak Zodi, President of Ethiopia, His Excellency Shalo Salwai, Prime Minister of Vanuatu, also Mr. Mustafa Bakuri, who is President of Masen, the Moroccan Agency for Solar Energy, and the President of the African Development Bank, Akinwumi Adesine. Adesina. Thank you very much indeed. So, Prime Minister Schering, as Chair of the Group, what will the least developed countries do to tackle the challenges posed by climate change? And I must remind you all, you have about three minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as I share my thoughts on climate change, a vivid image of lush green valleys, crisp river, snow-clad mountains comes to my mind. And that image, actually, I'm trying to describe my country, Bhutan. And my aspiration as head of the government is to hand over my country in the same state to the next generation that's coming up. But will I be able to do that? I doubt if the climate change hazards goes on unchecked. I take a lot of pride today to be speaking on behalf of LDC groups which we all know that LDCs are disproportionately affected by the hazards of climate change. LDCs are ready with our enhanced nationally determined contributions, national adaptation plans, and long-term low carbon climate resilience strategies for tw by 2020. We need your support to implement these initiatives. LDCs can do it. You can see the example of Bhutan. We're a small mountainous country, but with the visionary leadership of our kings, we are climate carbon negative today. Thank you. Many decades back, when we used to talk about forest of Bhutan, we always talked about environment. We never talked about climate change because we didn't realize it will come so soon. But yet, our far-sighted visionary kings have clearly spelled out in our constitution that Bhutan must at least have 60% of our country under forest cover. And today we have 72%. And most of these forests, thank you, thank you. And most of these forests is actually protected legally as biological corridors and national parks so that none of us can make use of that for commercial purpose. That's why Bhutan has always been a peace-loving country and we didn't really bother whether we are in the least developed countries group or not because we always approach the philosophy of cross-national happiness. We call upon all the countries to submit the Enhanced Climate, climate Pledge and long-term low greenhouse emission strategy by 2020. We are all aware that 1.5 degrees centigrade target as per Paris Agreement is no more good. Excellencies, as Secretary General so passionately called for this morning, allow me to present concrete plans on behalf of the LDC Group. Our vision is to deliver climate resilient pathway by 2030 and net zero emission by 2050. This is not just a statement. We will be using the life AR initiatives and numerous other LDC activities to fulfill the vision. To initiate this movement, we just need about USD 450 million. And we will be offering this for our global community. We ask you to invest in our institutions, capabilities, net zero economies, and most important of all, we request you to invest in our genuine intentions. As a very, as a very passionate, actively operating surgeon, and now 
as head of the government, I would like to draw an analogy here. I have seen so many patients, and whenever patients come to us, we always advise them what to do and what not to do, what to eat and what not to eat. Some listen, many of them, they don't listen to our advices, only to come back down the line with incurable disease. And on climate change, I see exactly the same. Evidence is there. Scientists are telling us what to do, what not to do. If you don't listen to them, one day we'll have a world with incurable disease. So with this, we have to take historic steps, bold decisions. Let's listen to a younger generation. Let's keep their world lush green, their rivers crisp, their mountains snow clad. Thank you. I wish this climate change action a grand success. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, <laughs> may I respectfully remind all our presenters to, uh, I'd appreciate it if you could just stay within the time constraints that we have because we have plenty more speakers and otherwise it will affect their ability to make their uh, statements. Uh, we move to the president of Ethiopia. Th this country has very much been a leader on climate change for a long time now. So uh, tell us what are African countries doing to make the transition away from fossil fuels to clean energy? Thank you. Can I go there? Uh, I, I would stay here and I would keep comments abbreviated if you would okay. be so kind. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Zainab. <clears throat> Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Ethiopia, as a co-lead for the energy transition track with Denmark and c 4 all has worked with other coalition members, Morocco, and presented actionable proposals under Coalition for Sustainable Energy Access. The coalition specifically identified leaving no one behind as one focus area in light of the many people still without access to clean energy in the LDCs. In fact, with a commitment that of all the stakeholders involved in the Coalition for Sustainable Energy Access Initiative could help to achieve SDG 7 and provide universal energy access by 2030. The three main objectives of the initiatives are 100% affordable and renewable LDC electricity access by 2030, 100% electricity from renewable energy sources in all LDCs by 2050, and 100% utilization of energy efficiency potentials by 2040. To attend this goal, the coalition has developed four main areas of action. First, development of a generic model to understand and supply the needs of energy access in terms of electrification, cooling, heating, irrigation, water supply and sanitation and clean cooking. Second, master the needs of renewable energy solutions. Third, creating best practice sharing platform for the financing energy access to reach the 80, 40 million population and leave no one behind requires considerable commitment from different sources. The Coalition for Sustainable Energy Access is fully endorsed by members of the LDCs group. We also think energy transition co-lead, we also thank energy transition co-lead Denmark and another coalition member, Italy, for fully supporting the coalition. Our thanks goes to all the partners that have been supporting the coalition's initiative. We also commend DRC's effort to coordinating the LDC Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Initiatives for Sustainable Devel Development Initiative, which serves as the basis for our Sustainable Energy Access Initiative. Morocco's contribution in line with the South-South cooperation spirit is worth mentioning. Finally, I would like to reiterate the LDC's call for action on financial support, technology development, and capacity building as, Kela, as well as they are essential for LDCs and other developing countries to attain their national climate objectives by, for 2020 and beyond. One last point, we also call for building bridges between funders and recipients to help ensure financial and other forms of support and flowing in the predictable manner to support action on the ground pre and post 2020. Last but not least, I would like to mention one success story from Ethiopia, planting 4 billion seedlings annually across Ethiopia, inclusive of post care. Two months ago, 
more than 350 million trees were planted within 12 hours, surpassing the planned 200 million per day, and also breaking world record of 66 million trees planted per day. With the 4 billion tree plantation per year, <coughs> with the 4 billion tree plantation per year, it's easy to estimate the contribution towards enormous carbon sequestration, and I thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, thank you. <laughs> Prime Minister Selwise, an island state, Vanuatu, is very exposed to the effects of climate change. So, what are your plans to increase ambition and adapt to climate change? I'd appreciate some abbreviated comments. Thank you. Thank you, Moderator. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. The Republic of Vanuatu is incredibly on the front line of climate change emergency rank as a country with the most disaster exposure and risk on the planet. This does not stop our nation from uh, leading on climate action, both domestically and advocating internationally for the highest level ambition for both within and outside of the UN spaces and fora. But not like many LDCs and SIDS, have produced ambitious indices. Today, Vanuatu has the entry and wish to make the following new concrete action announcement. With this announcement, Vanuatu hopes to serve as a role model to emphasize that the current climate uh, crisis requires transformative uh, climate action by all, regardless of differentiated responsibilities and respective cap capabilities. Vanuatu announces uh, to the world that an allocation of 15% uh, of the government's uh, 2020 fiscal budget will be allocated to improve resilience. This puts domestic climate spending on par with uh, that for the health and education, demonstrating the priority with uh, which one of six to increase uh, resilience. Of course, we welcome any credible and genuine partnership to support uh, this national law and deal. Another wish is uh, also to announce uh, to the world but it will include quantitative, quantified uh, adaptation targets in uh, at least uh, two priority sectors in the 2020 revised indices to include a priority adaptation and loss and damage action. The revision will be designed to fit into the upcoming global stock take so as to measure both for domestic and international collective progress on adaptation. Lastly, I want to announce to the world that uh, it has uh, Commence building a global law coalition to bring to the fore the obligation of states under international law to protect the rights of present and future generations against the adverse effects of climate change. I thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mustafa Bakuri, um, just a couple of questions, please, to you uh, as uh, concise as possible, please. What can be done to help LDCs achieve their goal of 100% renewable energy and what role could South-South cooperation play in this? Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Secretary General, Your Royal Highness, Heads of State and Government, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I have the great privilege to speak to you today on a vital question for the most vulnerable people. LDCs, less developed countries. The majority of their people are at a critical stage. They are deprived of their rights and their most elementary needs are met, such as access to energy and drinking water. This hinders not only the potential for development of these countries, but also increases the climate of insecurity in the regions. Thus, therefore, we must not accept this uh, situation as a question of fate. We must stand up and act, particularly thanks to sustainable energy. And the Coalition for Sustainable Access to Energy is an incarnation of this will. We are strongly convinced, alongside Ethiopia, as has just been recalled by the President, that together, uh, strengthened by the commitment of 90 countries by our sides, as well as public and private institutions, the UN's ambition to leave no one behind is achievable by 2030. To achieve it, this coalition will be underpinned by principles of South-South cooperation and North-South cooperation to share experiences and knowledge, to facilitate a swift replication of best practices, models that have proven their worth in other countries and similar environments. This, because we can think that we can do it, that we are resolved to do it immediately. 
And this is a work, work that involves identifying and separate, establishing synergies between existing systems. I'm delighted to say to, today that we have the birth of our program for the start of 2020. And here the first specific actions will be launched um, for financial and legal support for development of accelerating renewable energy projects. We will also operationalize a center for sharing expertise for, expertise for capacity building. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now on our way to achieving this and we need to maintain the momentum and step it up. To conclude, His Majesty the Sikh, Mohammed VI one day declared as part of a cooperation that without complexes, we will be able, together be able to build our future, future. So let's walk this talk and to ladies and gentlemen, let's build our future with audacity and confidence. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bakuri. And President Adesina of the African Development Bank, what can the international community do to support the LDCs with ambitious climate action? And again, if you could truncate your comments, I'd be grateful. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. When we talk about LDCs, you're basically talking about Africa. Africa has 33 out of the 47 LDCs that we're talking about. And so that's 70 percent. And so when we're talking about climate change adaptation, Africa has been shortchanged when it comes to climate finance because Africa is not contributing so much to it, only 4%, but is bearing the brunt of it. But I'm not gonna come here today and uh, moan about things. I think the thing is what we are doing ourselves about it, because I believe development must be with pride, not with begging. First and foremost is that the African Development Bank, as Africa's bank, uh, we are doubling our financing for climate to $25 billion by 2025. And that is to support African countries. 49% of that would be for climate adaptation. So that's the first thing I want to say. The second thing that I want to say is with regard to energy. That's the reason that God gave Africa sunlight. The highest irradiation in the world. We supported Morocco sitting next to me here to build the world's largest solar power, the new Uzazate. And so the African Development Bank and its partners working with them have decided to launch a major program which is called Desert to Power in the Sahel of Africa that will construct the largest solar zone in the world. It will be 10,000 megawatts that will cover 11 countries that will allow us to power the whole of the Sahel using the power of the sun. And that's going to be a $20 billion investment to be able to do that. And that will create jobs that will revolutionize the Sahel, that will allow us to have green agriculture, that will reduce migration to Europe, and that will allow Sahel to develop with pride. And that's what it matters so much. The third thing I want to say has to do with disaster risk management. You know, when, when the floods happen, we move very quickly to support Malawi, Zimbabwe, and also Mozambique. The African Development Bank provided $103 million, but we are doing more than that now. I'm pleased to announce to you that we've launched a major initiative that's called Disaster Risk Financing Facility that will mobilize $250 million to provide insurance premiums for low-income countries to pay against catastrophic risk events, and that will allow them to mobilize a billion dollars of payout by 2030. And finally, let me say that coal is the past. Renewable energy is the future. For us at the African Development Bank, we're getting out of coal. We're not doing coal. And so we have launched what's called the Green Base Load Facility. It's going to be $500 million that will support countries to move out of coal and also out of fossil fuel to move straight into renewable energy. And we expect that that will allow them to have $5 billion to support that transition. We are sitting here, my sister, before I close, and this whole place looks green. The conversation about climate change started right in this hall. We've got to finish it right in this hall because when we make this world to be resilient against climate change, it's not only good for us, we live, have a better life, but we actually leave the next generation also better. And I'm sure that together we can do that. Thank you and God bless everybody. Thank you. And thank you to all our presenters. Thank you.
Um, so I may now um, invite to the stage His Excellency Donald Tusk, President of the European Council. And uh, Mr. Tusk is going to tell us what the European Union's plan is within his allotted time, I hope. Thank you. This place. Dear friends, Europe is determined to lead the fight against today's climate threat. That is why the European Union is more resolved than never to implement the Paris Agreement fully and effectively. The EU has already exceeded its emission reduction target for 2020 and will surpass its target for 2030. Instead of the foreseen 40%, we expect a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions of around 45% as compared to 1990 levels. Turning our targets into concrete action is what matters, and this is what the EU is doing. Our economies need massive investments to become climate neutral. Therefore, at least 25% of the EU's next long-term budget will be dedicated to climate-related activities. And we are also taking concrete action to bring in private capital. In the coming weeks, the EU, in partnership with like-minded countries worldwide, will launch the International Platform on Sustainable Finance. This will help private investors to identify and take advantage of the green investment opportunities across the globe. The EU's emissions make up only around 9% of the global total. With this in mind, the EU is strengthening cooperation with all partner countries. As the world's biggest climate finance donor, the EU together with its member states are providing over 40% of public climate finance worldwide. These contributions have more than doubled since 2013, exceeding 20 billion euros per year. And we will scale up our support even further, including through the European Investment Bank, which is the European Union's financial arm. The European Council has made it clear that it expects the EIB to increase its ambition to deliver on climate action and environmental sustainability within the EU, but also in supporting our climate objectives globally. Looking ahead, we know that Europe must go further and faster. The President-elect of the European Commission will present a European Green Deal in her first 100 days in office. She has also suggested the strengthening of the EU's emission reduction target for 2030 to 50% or even 55% in a responsible way. Early next year, the European Union will submit an ambitious long-term strategy to our international partners. I am convinced that Europe will win the race to become the world's first climate neutral continent. The EU objective of climate neutrality by 2050 has already been endorsed by a large majority of our member states. And personally, I would say that it is just a matter of little time before all EU countries subscribe to it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Donald Tusk. 
thank you very much indeed. May I now invite to the stage His Excellency Gitanis Nauseda, President of Lithuania. Please do share with us your plan, Mr. President, and within your allotted time, please, no more. Thank you so much. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we have been discussing climate change for a long time. Today we know that it poses a serious challenge to many animal and plant species. It degrades fragile ecosystems and brings devastation to the world we are living in. Some say that we must save the world. This is not exactly accurate. First of all, we must save ourselves. Lithuania fully supports transition to renewable energy, including solar and wind energy. We are developing specific measures to encourage energy consumers to become energy prosumers, consumers who actively participate in electricity production in a sustainable way. We are introducing uh, a unique remote accounting system for renewable energy generation and consumption in different localities. However, one of the, our brightest success stories is sustainable heating and the development of related technologies. Lithuania believes that energy needs for heating can be covered by a large extent and especially uh, so in multi-apartment uh, estates by biomass. This widespread renewable uh, resource can be used in a sustainable way to mitigate climate change and facilitate transition to a green economy. In Lithuania, the share of biomass in residential district heating has increased from 30 to 70% over the last five years, while at the same time, average heating prices uh, have fallen by 30 to 40 percent. The biomass exchange launched in Lithuania has clearly demonstrated that trade organized in this way is essential for moving on to a sustainable heating. Our experience shows that transition to biomass in the res residential centralized district heating sector promotes sustainable regional development, diversifies rural uh, economies, and reduces national dependence on imported fossil fuels. It also reduces greenhouse gas emissions and helps to fight climate change. I am personally committed to effective and strong action against climate change. Therefore, I, I am launching a global initiative, transition to the sustainable heating as a part of the decarbonization goal. We need to raise the awareness about biomass and its benefits to the environment and the economy as widely as possible. I am pleased to inform you that our initiative so far has been supported by a number of countries, including Sweden, Austria, Ukraine, Georgia, and Latvia. Some other countries are on the way to join it as well. I thank all of them. Now is the time. Let us move towards a better common future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. So, um, for our next...